Dr. Pollack, welcome to the podcast. It's a real honour to be able to meet you finally. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm delighted and uh, thrilled to be with you. Um, glad we could connect. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think I, I came across your work actually quite relatively recently. Um, it was probably uh, about six months ago initially, and I've been speaking with people and following a few more people who are very much in align with your work. Um, we actually had someone on the podcast not that long ago talking about the importance of light, water and magnetism within the context of human health. So she touched very briefly on the role that water and a specific type of water can play in health. But I think this conversation, this topic is going to be completely new for a lot of our listeners. Um, so before we dive into your work, Dr. Pollack, are you happy just to kind of maybe introduce yourself a little bit? Um, okay, so I need to uh, overcome my uh, innate shyness. And uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been a professor at the University of Washington for many years, essentially my entire career. You know, there's the Mount Rainier factor and um, the, this uh, nearby glorious peak draws a lot of people. Um, uh, and so it's, it's drawn me and I've been here for my entire career. I started uh, by studying a muscle contraction uh, at the molecular level, trying to figure out <clears throat> how the muscle proteins interact with one another to produce force and motion. And I spent a couple of decades um, um, on that. And, and the evidence we had um, uh, challenged the prevailing view. Um, the prevailing view was put forth by um, a Nobel laureate who passed about um, almost a decade ago, Sir Andrew Huxley, who was, you know, among uh, being a member of the Huxley family, uh, the famous Huxley family, it was a kind of Nobel, Nobelist among Nobelists. Um, when he walked into the room, there was a hush. It was as though God had entered uh, the room. On the other hand, the evidence that we had challenged directly head on his point of view about how muscles work. And, and so um, I guess the, the end result, the bottom line is that we made our contribution. Uh, I, I felt it was a major contribution. Um, we wound up uh, suggesting a, an alternative model of how these proteins interact to produce force. And almost nobody paid attention, um, which is okay. Uh, there is a measure of satisfaction in putting forth a mechanism uh, that fits the evidence uh, rather than one that doesn't fit the evidence, but follows along the pathway carved by this great Nobel laureate. I learned something from that experience. You know, I learned, I learned that um, um, many scientists are less independent minded um, than you might think and that careerism is 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 really an important feature it's really easy to forge um, a successful career by following in the footsteps of a great nobel laureate rather than following in the murky muddy footsteps <laughs> of um, a challenger and it was okay and i still feel okay about that in fact <clears throat> in fact i'm invited annually to give a lecture to students learning about muscle contraction in, in Calgary, in Canada. And uh, my friend uh, runs a class there uh, for graduate students, and they learn about the standard mechanism. And then I come each year, he invites me year after year, it's been like 15 years or so, and I present an alternative. And the students quite regularly come back to me and they say, my goodness, the evidence for your point of view is so compelling. You, you've done so many experiments, uh, so many controls, checks and such. How could anybody doubt what you're suggesting? <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> I, I don't have enough time to launch into the issues that uh, confront scientists these days, especially scientists whose evidence challenges the prevailing point of view. It's a problem. Uh, it's a problem. It's a world problem. It's not just in science. It's 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 throughout. But that's not the reason for this podcast. Anyway, along the way, 
um, I came to, to think that, my goodness, um, in the field of muscle contraction, the word water is almost never mentioned. There, there are a few pioneers, um, including my uh, friend uh, Reuven Tirosh from Israel, uh, and, and uh, scattered others who, who really think that water is central, but, but the whole field essentially treats muscles as, as though they were operating in a vacuum, whereas the muscles in your body and probably my body um, as well um, are two thirds water. And, and in fact, if you take that two thirds water by volume and instead uh, think of, of the fraction, the number of water molecules relative to other molecules in the muscle, uh, it turns out if you do the count, just line up all the molecules and you do the count, it's more than 99% of the molecules in your muscle and other cells as well in your muscle uh, are water molecules. <laughs> You know, because they're really tiny. And so in order to fill that two thirds volume, you need to stuff in a, a lot of them. And um, I came to think, this is nonsense. How could it be that 99% of the molecules in your cell or in your body don't do anything? Um, if, you were, if you were to read a, a book on cell biology or physiology or biochemistry or, anything of the like. Um, you may read in chapter one that water is very important. And then the word water is never mentioned again because it's treated as though it's insignificant. It's like, it's like the, uh, the bath that bathes the more important molecules of life. Uh, it doesn't do anything, it just sits there, you know? Uh, and that seemed really strange uh, to me. How, how could nature, um, bestow upon us the pleasure of 99% of molecules being water molecules, but for nothing, they don't really do anything. They just kind of sit there. Um, I'm not sure how you <laughs> would think about that, but it's really difficult to understand why nature would do that. <laughs> if these molecules don't do anything, you see. On the other hand, you know, there are or were or have been uh, points of view uh, that suggested that not only that does water do something, but actually it's central in everything that the cells do. And that, that point of view, uh, I mentioned this point of view because that's really how we, we started. There are a couple of pioneers, uh, especially. And one of them is the father of modern biochemistry, Albert St. Georgi. Uh, he passed about two, two or three decades ago. And, and the guy was pure genius. He, he discovered vitamin C. He got a Nobel Prize for that. And many people considered him by virtue of his amazing creativity in so many different fields. As I said, as the father of modern biochemistry. And he knew that water was absolutely central to everything that goes on in the body. Um, and one of his famous aphorisms is, it goes something like, um, life is water dancing to the tune of solids. <laughs> it's, it's cool, yeah. And, and uh, he knew that, that, that water was absolutely central, not only to muscle contraction, by the way, that was one of his fields as well. Um, he said um, in, in uh, a, a book that he wrote on, on muscle contraction that the contraction was caused by um, um, a destructuring of water. In other words, he knew that the water um, uh, in the cells, especially in the muscle cells, but all cells is so-called structured. It has kind of structure to it. It's not what we think of when we think of, of um, water molecules uh, randomly oriented relative to one another and dancing around at a furious rate. Uh, not, not like that. And um, and, and, and so he said in, in the case of muscle contraction in particular, but he was referring to all the biology, but as an example in muscle contraction, he said life, he said muscle contraction is due to the contraction of myosin, which is one of the proteins in muscle, triggered by a destructuring of water. Okay, so the water, he said the trigger is, um, you start with water in the structured state, 
and a uh, signal comes and the water then converts from the structured water to ordinary water. And then of course, it'll go back again at the end of the contraction. He said that was critical, central to it. Oddly, um, in my own book written on muscle contraction, written in 1990, without knowing uh, St. George's book came to the same conclusion. So, but he got there 50 years earlier <laughs> and, and he knew that water was, was central to all of life. And then came um, Gilbert Ling um, and uh, Gilbert reached um, a, a kind of similar uh, point of view, but Gilbert spent the better part of his life studying water inside of cells, not just muscle cells, but, but all cells. And Gilbert came from China. He was in the first cohort of young Chinese scientists picked from throughout all of China to come to the US um, oh. after World War II, first cohort. There were three of them. There was, besides Gilbert, uh, a biologist, there was a physicist and a chemist. And the physicist went on to win a Nobel Prize. And they all thought you know, that Gilbert was really the cleverest among, among the three. So Gilbert started, um, I'm told this, but I, uh, obviously I, I don't know, no direct information. And by the way, the guy who won the Nobel Prize, the Chinese scientist became more famous um, uh, for, for his romantic exploits uh, rather than for his scientific exploits. Okay. So at age close to 90, he married, he married his translator um, who was age 30 or 35 or something like this. And it, it was almost scandalous throughout China. He became very famous for all of that rather than for the uh, obscurity of whatever he might have gotten his Nobel Prize for. <laughs> anyway, so, but back to Gilbert Ling. So Gilbert, um, Gilbert spent most of his life, he wrote six or seven books uh, about water in biology. And he said that, he said that water uh, has biological water in particular. And by the way, uh, I'll tell you in a, in a few moments how we more or less confirmed his, his ideas, but slightly differently uh, from what he was espousing. And what we found goes beyond biology to, to all of nature. Gilbert was talking particularly about biology. And he said that in a, in a typical cell, your cells, my cells, uh, everyone's cells, that the water molecules actually line up, they stack like soldiers at attention. So, so you got one water molecule, which you can represent as a dipole, plus at one end, minus at the other, you know, a little, little bean with plus and minus. And, and he said, they're all stacked, lined up in a biological cell. And that was the essence of, of his thesis. And he had a lot of, a lot of um, evidence to back up some kind of structuring of water. So he, he came after St. Georgie and those two were pioneers. And, um, you know, I might say that for us, those were the shoulders uh, um, that we, that our, our group stand on. Um, many, many big, <laughs> hefty uh, shoulders. So we started, uh, or I started, I mean, our lab started a couple of decades ago after a, a trip that I made to Hungary, where there was a symposium um, to celebrate or to honor um, the career of a biophysicist, a prominent one who had passed. And his, uh, his field, he had two fields. One was muscle contraction and the other was water. And I came to represent, I was invited to represent the muscle community because his ideas were not so different from um, my ideas, uh, our ideas, um, but, the second group about water, um, Gilbert Ling was there and, and, and so are a dozen other people. And I was really impressed because the evidence they presented so, so strongly reinforced the ideas of um, structured ordered water that had been put forth by Gilbert and by Albert St. Georgie. I was impressed. So I went home um, and um, you know I, I, I know that I'm, easily deluded into uh, um, pursuing attractive ideas. So I tried, I tried it on my students. I said, here's a book, this guy, Gilbert Ring, here, Ling, here's one of his books, take a look, what do you think? Every one of them came back to me and said, this is amazing. If this, they hadn't known about it, 
Um, and they said, if this guy is right, all of biology needs is wrong and needs to start again from the ground up. Well, that intrigued me. <laughs> and so we immediately began um, doing experiments. And uh, I must admit to a little bit of, um, you might say, uh, cheating. I had money in my laboratory to cover experiments on muscle contraction. And, um, and I diverted um, uh, surreptitiously some of those funds to begin to study water because I thought that the water was important not only for muscle contraction, but for all of biology. And that's how we started. And I'm sorry for going on so long <laughs> to respond to a short question, but I better stop here because I think you have other questions. <laughs> no, that's really interesting to kind of understand where, so almost the origins, certainly from your perspective with the work. Right. Um, so yeah, no, that's really interesting. Thank you for that, Dr. Pollack. So I guess the next question is, you've started to talk about sort of structured water um, and you obviously have your book, The Fourth Phase of Water. So I kind of want you to continue with this story. So what were some of the, your first findings with these investigations that you started on water? The first findings, uh, um, 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 we saw something that looked tentatively in agreement with all of those pioneers. So if you think about um, structured water, structure, um, uh, especially in, a, in a, a liquid, it's like a liquid crystal. The thing, the, the, everything is organized. And crystals uh, have a tendency to exclude virtually everything. So if you can imagine, for example, ice, when ice forms, it starts with water, but the water has a lot of junk in it. You know, but to get a pure crystal, um, purity means it's pure. It means it consists only of water um, and everything else is excluded. So as ice forms, uh, the, it, it tends to exclude whatever had been in the water previously. You can think of the, um, the bottom of a glacier, uh, the glacial moraine. So the ice forms um, and it kicks out, it pushes out all the junk that had been in the water. Okay, so, so the ice crystal is, is, is pure, and we were thinking the same thing should be true um, in, in um, so-called structured water, which we now call a, a different name, but we'll get to that. Um, we call it the fourth phase or um, exclusion zone, EZ, not, let's, let's get to that. Um, and so we were looking for a preparation uh, a, a biological preparation or a physical preparation or something to study in the laboratory um, where, where we could see that molecules and particles were excluded, just like we expect in, in ice. Mm -hmm. And by good fortune, I had met with a, um, a Japanese scientist um, at a conference who, who told us about some finding in the laboratory and um, and I immediately it clicked because his finding um, made a lot of sense to me. And so we, we, we um, reproduced what this Japanese scientist had done and we were looking for something special and we found it. So we took a, 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 some water with junk in it, particles. We use little tiny spheres called microspheres, which are used in biology. And so the water was full of these suspended microspheres and we, um, we put into the water uh, a gel. And we looked in the microscope um, at what was going on. So all there was was a, a chunk of gel sitting in a bath uh, containing water and suspended particles. And we looked and, and what we saw was amazing because we saw that uh, uh, next to the surface where the water was inter, uh, intersecting the gel, um, we could see dynamically that there was a region next to the gel that was growing that had no microspheres. It's like the microspheres were excluded uh, from that. And this region was started to grow and grow and grow. And over a period of five minutes or so, it grew to um, uh, a few hundred micrometers, that is uh, a few tenths of a millimeter. And we didn't even need a microscope to see it, although we looked in the microscope because it was so big. And we thought, my goodness, um, this 
this region, this really hefty size region is somehow, for some reason, pushing out those particles. And we thought, ah, maybe, maybe this is the region, maybe this is the, the, the region that was discussed um, by Gilbert Ling and Albert St. Georgi and others as a region where the water became a liquid crystal, not ordinary water, but this liquid crystal in water. And because it excluded, we called it the exclusion zone. It was a poor choice because, because there was so much more. But the advantage of that is, at least in the US, exclusion zone, EZ, you guys say EZ, so it doesn't work, but it's easy to remember, you see. <laughs> so, so EZ kind of caught on. And, and we often refer to the water in, in that zone as EZ water. Later, we called it fourth phase water. I think that's a better descriptor because this water is different from ordinary liquid water. It has order uh, to it. So it turned out the, uh, that the order in this water differed from what Gilbert Ling and others had originally thought, and I thought myself until we made a measurement. So what we found is when we started experimenting with it and we, we, we put electrodes, tiny electrodes, um, parenthetically electrodes invented by the same Gilbert Ling for which he should have gotten the Nobel prize because it's used so widely now. And, uh, and its use seemed to have garnered several other Nobel prizes, but Gilbert Ling missed. At any rate, we stuck electrodes in that zone and we found that the zone was not neutral. So water is neutral, right? It's got plus and minus, um, um, which neutralize H2O, the, the two pluses from the two H's and uh, double negative from the O gives you neutral water, but this region was not neutral, you see? And so it couldn't, it couldn't be ordinary water. It, it had to be, if our measurements were correct, um, it had to be some other, um, uh, variety of, of water or is that water transformed into something and after doing you know many experiments uh, i don't want to bore you with with all of those the nature of all of those experiments we were able to conclude um something about the structure of that zone uh, we confirmed its negativity and also we confirmed a battery-like feature so think about it um think about it you start with water and the water, uh, when it, it meets this uh, surface, the water transforms itself into something else that has negative charge. But it, the water started neutral. So if you create something negative from something neutral, what about the positives? Where do they, where do they go? Right. And we found that they went just beyond that exclusion zone, you see. So the exclusion zone was negative, uh, typically. And the zone beyond was positive. <laughs> so what is that? Minus plus, it's a battery. Um, and indeed, we found that in the laboratory, we found that if we stuck one electrode in the negative and one in the positive, uh, it behaved like a battery. And we can get electrical current out of that to light um, a bulb, light bulb or a LED. Um, and it was phenomenal because because what it means is that somehow that the water is has has become an energy source, right? All it needs to do is meet meet a particular solid, and we we now know many many solids uh, are able to do this as long as their surfaces are hydrophilic or water loving, meaning that if you drop water on it, the water spreads out instead of beating up like Teflon. Okay. So th those are the kinds of surfaces that start doing this. And, um, and so the water just meets the, the surface. The first molecular layer gets converted into something that has a negative charge. It's a honeycomb kind of structure. If you look at it head on, what you'll see is a bunch of hexagons. Um, and then that first layer forms a template for the creation of the second layer, which forms a template for the, et cetera. And these, these sheets progressively build up um, and, and they can build up to, as I said, a few tenths of a millimeter. And with certain nucleating surfaces, we've seen up to even close to a millimeter. Wow. Um, in fact, in, 
we published uh, in in very odd circumstances even one meter <laughs> um, uh, this is or I should say three feet because it was done in the U.S. Um, but at any rate, uh, it, it quite quite extensive. So. Um, so you have a you have a battery, and now if you think about the battery, uh, next point, if, if batteries run out of juice, right? Your cell phone, if you forget to plug it in when you go to sleep, and next morning, it's drained. Um, and the same thing applies for you know any source of energy. You can't get something for nothing. You can't get a battery. You can't get uh, potential energy from nothing. You have to put energy into it. And for your cell phone, it's electrical energy. Um, and so the question is, what I've described to you, the, the easy water, a negative and the positive charges, the separated charges, potential energy, where does the input energy come from to create this? It can't, it doesn't come from nowhere, it comes from somewhere. And I got to admit, we couldn't figure it out. Um, and, um, you know, I, I was scratching my head, that's why some hair is missing. Uh, and, um, and finally, it was a student, a young undergraduate student in the laboratory doing what he was not supposed to do, <laughs> who, who basically uh, helped us figure it out. So he was in the laboratory and he was, he was studying this exclusion zone that I, I mentioned and sitting next to him in the laboratory was a lamp. It was one of those gooseneck lamps, you know, you could bend it uh, any way you, and you know, for fun, he was bored, I guess, or something. He took the lamp and he shined it on the chamber. And, and what he saw was that the illuminated region, the easy water would grow enormously. And he, he quickly ran to my office, called me, and I popped my head in and I saw it. I was astonished how it, it had grown, you know, not by 10%, but a factor of three or four. Um, and, I, and I looked in the microscope, or maybe it wasn't, I can't remember, it was, it was a while back, maybe my, my naked eye. And I saw, I said, well, why don't you turn off the light and see what happens? So he turned off the light and it went right back to the original. So whatever he saw, the effect of light was reversible. You add light, it grows, take the light away, it returns um, back. And so, you know, it didn't, it didn't take a genius to uh, to figure out that it looks like light is responsible for growth of this. So then we uh, we were um, uh, obviously prompted to do real experiments to find out um, which wavelengths of light might be responsible for this because you know the lamp contains a range uh, starting from the ultraviolet to the visible um, and at the long wavelengths to the infrared and we studied. The whole range, that entire range of wavelengths, uh, to see what's responsible. So ultraviolet, nothing. Um, violet, nothing. I, I, the rest of the visible toward the reds, essentially nothing. Infrared, wow. Um, so the the uh, effect of infrared energy, particularly at a wavelength of three micrometers, which is what water likes to absorb um, most at that wavelength, that particular wavelength created enormous growth of, of the um, exclusion zone or fourth phase. Uh, and, and so we, you know, we, we pinpointed it, we had it. It was, it was infrared energy that's responsible for creating that battery. Um, so um, you got this, this, this battery and, you know, the question, I guess the question that you might want to ask, I'm putting words in your mouth, is how does all this relate to biology? <laughs> Was that your next question? Yeah, of that, of that and then thinking about some of the, I guess, the practical takeaways of this as well, but we can get to that later. Yeah, if you remind me and, you know, ask the question, I'm really happy to uh, talk about that uh, issue because that's really exciting. Um, um, and, 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 and before that, even the practical takeaways in terms of health uh, uh, in particular, because, okay, so um, in, in terms of applicability of this stuff, and we know whenever you have, um, or um, 
an appropriate hydrophilic surface, easy water will grow. You know, you start with ordinary water, and you put infrared energy in, and and it converts to easy, and the easy grows. And the question is, well, what about your cells? Uh, does this apply in your cells? Well, you've got lots of hydrophilic surfaces because the water is filled with proteins, nucleic acids, and other solids uh, um, occupying essentially one third of the volume, uh, um, two thirds of the volume uh, of the cell, you know, and and uh, um, and the surfaces, the charges tend to be on the surfaces of these molecules, which which make them just exactly right as hydrophilic surfaces. So you'd expect that the water inside your cells would be uh, at least partially, if not completely the easy water of fourth phase water. There's actually not much space uh, for, the, for the water, you know, um, um, uh, because there are so many solids inside the cell. So in fact, the distance between two solids on average is less than seven, a span of seven water molecules worth. Uh, wow. So there aren't too many layers of water, uh, in fact. Um, so uh, um, you think that the water inside your cells would not be liquid water, but easy water. And you can confirm that yourself by a very simple experiment. Take a sharp knife, cut yourself. Now, <laughs> what comes out? Well, of course, blood comes out. Um, but what about water? Does water come out? You'd expect that if, the, if, if your cells um, can contain liquid water that the water would come pouring out just as they would from a broken pipe um, that filled with water, you know, but that doesn't happen. So the water inside your cell cells is is not liquid water. It it's gel like water. It's it's a, the easy water. And and this is actually established um, in the 1950s or even earlier by a German scientist, Fry Wüssling who wrote a book on the subject saying, hey, look at all the evidence. The water inside the cell is gel-like. It's highly viscous. Uh, that's why it doesn't, come, it doesn't come pouring out. And we now know that this, this kind of water that sits next to the hydrophilic surface is easy water. So your cells are filled with easy water. Now, if um, that being the case, you'd think, oh my goodness, because this water has potential energy, right? Um, if you, if you think about it, the inside of the cell is negatively charged, and that's been established many, many times. You stick an electrode in, and it's negative with respect to the outside. That's in all textbooks, but the explanation is, you know, in my view, erroneous, but let's set, set that aside. But So where does all that negative charge uh, come from? And we argue that it's the water, that this easy water that fills your cell is negatively charged. And, and, and so um, that's why the inside of the cell it, it, it is negatively charged because it's filled with easy water. Now, so, so here comes the punchline. Um, if you got all that energy inside, inside your cell, it, all these pent up negative charges that repel each other and they wanna get away as quickly as possible, but they're kind of stuck there. So, so this is potential energy. It can get released if the cell undergoes um, a transition from the resting state to, as in muscle cells, to the active state, where, as St. Georgie said, the water undergoes a transition um, from its resting state uh, to its active state. And in so doing, all those negative charges um, contain potential energy and is delivered uh, to the cell. Um, and, and so that energy, you know, when you think about it, why, where does the energy of your cells come from? You know, so we think it comes from ATP, uh, right? And, and now we have another potential source of energy. It's electrical energy. Um, and so it boils down to, um, you know, the, the scene of, well, you know, if we got this other source of energy, then is it really true that um, that the cell derives energy not only from chemical energy, from the food we eat, from ATP, but also 
from infrared energy that builds easy water and 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 creates all of this negative charge and stuff which then can be delivered we don't know the answer um really we we m mostly mostly think of atp but you know the atp story has a has a a problem uh, to it. I, let, let me just digress for a moment. This was brought out by Gilbert Ling. You know, the idea that ATP has a high energy bond um, came out by a, a group of a chemists, I don't know, 70, 80 years ago. Um, and and apparently that, that gained real traction and the traction increases or continues to this day. Um, we all think we we know on the other hand uh, gilbert ling in his website um reminds us and i think the website still exists gilbertling.org <coughs> notwithstanding his death a, a year ago uh he points out that there was a challenge to this that the paper suggesting the high energy bond and atp came out and one year later another uh group said no 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 um, these guys made a mistake. They made a simple arithmetic mistake. And that arithmetic mistake led to the um, erroneous conclusion that there's a high energy bond. No such thing. Well, since then, apparently nobody has taken up this challenge. And nobody has said, well, wait a second, there's one point of view. And then there's another point of view. Uh, and which one is correct? And to this day, it's not clear which one is correct. However, it's really important for the progress of science to take take the challenge seriously. And um, you know, some well-equipped group um, could take on the challenge and and um, forge a pathway into this uh, area and find out what's going on. Because there is an alternative possibility, and that is the electrical charge that gets released. So. You know, in theory, um, it's possible that uh, this electrical phenomenon could represent anywhere between zero and 100% of the energy that actually delivered. We simply don't know. But this is a question that should be, you know, on the front burner um, uh, of, of, of any legitimate biochemical um, approach, because, you know, we got to know where the energy comes from. So, um, yeah, so when you think about, for example, the, the uh, breatharians who um, don't, don't eat, but somehow manage to get by quite well, uh, and there are a surprising number of them, um, you know, um, where do they get their energy? Well, if the energy comes from easy water, um, from, from the electrical energy, it derives from infrared energy, and infrared energy is all around us. You can't get rid of it. You, um, if if you were uh, to turn off all the lights where in the room where you're sitting, you know, and whip out your smartphone and try to take a photograph, you see nothing. It's black. But if if your smartphone um, had a camera with an infrared sensor instead of a visible light sensor, you'd see. Um, uh, your your beard and your um, blinking eyes and uh, and all of those awards on your on your wall, <laughs> including um, well, beautifully right because everything is generating infrared energy and so that energy that energy uh, deriving ultimately from the sun, uh, whose energy fifty percent or so of the sun's energy that reaches us is in the infrared region. That's why we feel warm the sun feels warm, um, uh, that's what's responsible. And in our bodies, it, so in our bodies, it comes from outside, from those sources I just mentioned. And also your metabolism generates heat. And heat is essentially the end product of infrared um, radiation. Um, and so you've got infrared energy being generated in, in your gut and um, the core of your body. So you've got it coming from inside and outside, building easy water. And easy water represents potential energy, which can be delivered to power essentially anything and everything that's going on inside your body. Okay, so go ahead, you're gonna ask me something. No, 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 I'm just enjoying this. <laughs> uh, okay, well then we get to, 
disease and dysfunction. Yeah. Okay. So, so the central thesis uh, um, that I want to uh, bring to you about the function of the cells involves, obviously, involves the easy water, and um, um, and and it follows along what Saint George was talking about, and and also what what I presented in a. Um, a book previous to the one you mentioned. The previous one is called Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life. And, and the central theme of that book was not only that the water inside your cells is structured, but that um, the, the actions of your cells, each of your cells in, involves a, um, a transition, a so-called phase transition, where the water uh, undergoes a transition from the structured or easy or fourth phase to ordinary water, and then back again at the end of the activity, right? So the water is centrally involved in everything that the cell does, which means that if you have a deficiency of this water, um, uh, in other words, per parenthetically, you're dehydrated, your cells are dehydrated, same thing. Um, that your cells are not going to function um, as as well as if they have a full complement of uh, easy water. So dehydration leads to loss of function. So what do you? The question is, well, gee, you know, what what do you do to reverse that? And um, and there there are various ways of which you almost certainly know all of them or uh, some of them. Um, uh, and um, uh, and they're they're really simple. W would you like me to kind of go down the list? Uh, yeah, let's go for it. Okay. Well, the first, the obvious one is drink more water, because when you drink water, the water your body, because of the energy, um, infrared energy that's inside and outside, your body converts that some of that water to easy water. So your cells will any cells that might have been deficient in the amount of easy water uh, should, should build up. So that's, that's one. The second is, um, uh, the second is, is juicing. So you, you know about juicing, but not everybody does. And you know, by juicing, we're talking about going into your backyard, taking some of the plants that are growing, the nice, fresh green leaves and, and others. And, and squeezing out the juice and uh, grinding it um, to smithereens and extracting the juice and drinking the juice. So what is that juice? Well, those freshly grown plant cells, um, they're healthy and inside each one of those cells is easy water, the same as inside of our cells. And so you're squeezing out a lot of easy water and you're drinking the easy water. And by drinking the easy water, you're essentially bypassing the step of having to convert water into easy water because it's already there. Right. And uh, my understanding from a, a lot of practitioners is, is that patients come with this or another problem and they're advised to, uh, to um, enjoy the fruits, so to speak, of, of juicing. And somehow they come back a few months later and they're better. Whatever was afflicting them has seemed to have retreated into the background and they're doing better. Um, and they've also um, side effect lost weight for whatever reason. Okay, so that's the second thing that anybody, anybody can do. Um, a third, third thing is um, uh, expose yourself to sunlight. Right. And, um, you know, your situation in UK is not so different from the situation that we experience in the Northwest here in, in the Seattle uh, area. We, we have a lot of winter gloom. <laughs> the sun doesn't peek through. And when the sun does peek through, uh, you look outside and, and look at the people walking by. Inevitably, they have smiles on their faces. <laughs> they feel good. And uh, the sun is out. Wow, beautiful. And what's going on? Well, the usual interpretation is, is um, a psychologically based uh, interpretation. They see the light of day, something comes through, and you know, after that dark gloom feels good. And that certainly might be true, but there's a, another uh, interpretation. Remember, 
I said that the sun contains roughly half of the energy from the sun is in the infrared region, and that region builds easy water. So when when the sun um, when the sun hits your your head, your face, whatever, um, you know, it imparts infrared energy, which means that it, it's it's going to build easy water in the cells of your brain. And some of the wavelengths do get through, and the evidence for that is you can actually um, take a, a, um, you can actually do imaging of the brain that way. You can take an infrared source, and the infrared energy uh, goes through the skull into the brain, gets scattered, gets picked up again by a sensor, and by a, a computer algorithm, you can get an image of what's inside the brain. So it must the energy must get through two times. Uh, and the sun's energy will be the same. So an alternative possibility is that just by going out in the sun, you're imparting um, energy to to the brain um, uh, and you feel good um, because the easy water builds up and your cells are then behaving in the way that they were, you might say, designed to, <laughs> to behave. And the, the default situation is feeling good, not feeling depressed. <laughs> Okay, now the fourth, that's the third one. The fourth is similar to that, but it's done artificially in a sense by immersing yourself into a sauna or as the Finns would say, a sauna. Um, um, and what, so what, what are you doing? Um, um, well, you're immersing yourself in, into heat and heat is essentially the same as infrared energy. So your body, your body is is um, being infused by infrared energy uh, is coming in all over your body. And what do we know about infrared energy? Well, it builds easy water. Therefore, if you have a deficiency of easy water, whether it's in your brain or your muscle or your rear end or your left leg, uh, it, it, the energy is going to build easy water. And um, the easy water, build up will convert dysfunction into function. So if you have a, a muscle ache or something, or a, a, um, you know any, any kind of issue with, with your cell, there's some chance that the um, dysfunction will be reversed simply by exposing yourself to infrared energy in that way. And I think many people experience that. I remember myself at a conference in Finland, way north, in Finland, above the Arctic Circle, um, and I was there just at the time it was, um, you know, daylight for almost 24 hours. It was quite an interesting I experience, and, you know, I had to give a seminar uh, uh, presentation, and I was suffering serious jet lag. I gave the presentation, and I was really tired, and, you know, then in the evening there was a banquet, so of course I went to the banquet. It was at some remote location, and there was good food and um, a few pleasant um, uh, talks and uh, whatever. And then I was, all I wanted to do was to get back to the hotel to get to sleep because I was just so tired. And the uh, organizer of the conference walks up to the microphone. And I was sure that he was going to announce, okay, the doors of the bus are open. You can get back. We'll take you back to your hotel. He said, the saunas are now open. <laughs> uh, and we got three of them. One of them is dry, one of them is moist, and the other is, I don't remember what. You had your choice. Uh, and I thought, oh, sh excuse me. Uh, damn, uh, you know, uh, I don't. Uh, but I, I guess I succumbed, because, as did many of the people. And I sat in there uh, for 20 minutes or so. And I remember the aftermath, I took my shower, got out of there, and it was, it was as though I had a good night's sleep. I, you know, I, uh, I was ready, raring to go. I couldn't, I couldn't believe the transition um, from before and after. And I think that's not a, atypical. So it's essentially the infrared energy builds easy, um, changes any kind of dysfunction into function. Well, perhaps not any kind, but it certainly goes in that direction. Okay, that was four. Uh, number five, substances that have been known throughout the ages, um, throughout the ages to, to um, 
uh, be good for health. And, and many of them come from the Ayurvedic tradition, you know, 5,000 years ago or even, even earlier that are carried on even, even to this day. So for example, turmeric is, is one of those. And, you know, a lot of people know that uh, if you take turmeric, uh, you got a problem, whether it's your left ear or your right toe, um, it's going to help uh, or anywhere in between, you know, and, and um, the tradition in India, the ancient tradition says that will be the case. And we, we wondered, how, how can it be that one agent can have so many um, effects throughout the body? So there are two hypotheses that you can think of. One is that, well, somehow you have turmeric receptors in every organ throughout your body. It doesn't seem so likely, right? Um, and the other one is that um, the turmeric impacts a certain substance that, that then exists throughout the body, one, one substance. And that, of course, is water, because water is everywhere. So if turmeric had an impact, if turmeric built easy water, all of that might be explainable because the water is everywhere, right? Um, and and we tested that, and we we tested that um, by using that same experimental preparation that I began uh, to talk about um, at the beginning of our conversation. And you put a little turmeric in it. Well, it's a bit more sophisticated than put a little turmeric. But basically, you put a little turmeric in, and it builds easy water. The easy that you saw got bigger, um, and 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 that existed over a broad range of concentration that would be relevant to the concentration that might be in your body. Uh, so we established that for turmeric, but not only turmeric. There, there are um, other substances known to be generally good for health, uh, positive for health. Every one of the ones that we tried. Um, uh, built easy water, and uh, and they they included um, uh, basil, so-called holy basil. They included aspirin, which, as you know, comes from the bark of the willow tree. Um, included aspirin, uh, that I, as I as mentioned, and and um, and several other uh, substances um, that were generally good for health. And you know, the 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 queen of all of them uh, turned out. To, to to be a ghee, you know, clarified butter, which again has been used in the Ayurvedic tradition um, for thousands of years and is still used by uh, uh, people in, in India. And you could measure an exclusion zone next to ghee, ghee being the nucleating surface that was almost a millimeter. And we, we published that. So anyway, the point is that for number five, <laughs> That, that what you can do um, to build easy water in your body is to ingest some of these substances, which have been known for years to be good for health, but we now understand perhaps what the underlying mechanism might be, simple buildup of easy water. So that's five. And let me just end with a, a sixth one. There are a few more, but you know, we got to be reasonable. Um, um, and that is connecting yourself to the earth. So, yeah, you nod your head because you, of course, know all about that. But um, so it's, it's been known that if you connect yourself electrically to the earth, you feel better. Um, and that's been studied now for uh, quite a while by uh, quite a num number of people trying to figure out what, what the mechanism is. And I'd like to suggest to you a simple mechanism. Um, that has to do thematically with, with the same. But, um, but you know, um, for example, if you, if you do that, if you, if you walk, if you take off your shoes and socks and walk on the beach near the water, it feels good. Um, you know, and the question is, why does it feel good? And, um, and I got to interject with an experience that I can never forget. Uh, I was a kid and growing up in, uh, in, Brooklyn, uh, New York, where we have a beach, uh, uh, Brighton Beach. The name is familiar to you, being in UK, but we 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 copy. Um, and uh, you know, in the summertime, all the kids and families would be um, blanket to blanket. Uh, there, you almost couldn't walk 
from the from the city to the water because of the concentration of bodies uh, over there. Anyway, I was there with friends and, and we were having fun and we would bury one another in the sand right near the water. And I was the final victim. They buried me up to my neck, allowing me to continue living at least for some time. And what I remember is a feeling that I could only call bliss. It felt so good. And when finally it came time to leave, um, I didn't want to leave uh, because this feeling, I mean, it, it was so incredibly intense that I remember it to this day. That's how intense it was. And I don't remember too much about my childhood to this day, but I remember that feeling of bliss. It was unmistakable. And again, I was connecting myself to the earth. So what's going on? Well, what's going on, uh, I think, um, which follows the story I've been telling you is, is that it builds easy water. And let me explain how. Um, and, and the how is that the earth, which we think of as a neutral body, is not neutral. Um, I, started, I started my um, uh, education career studying electrical engineering. And so you'd think that I would learn something about you know, the elect electrical behavior of the earth, but no professor ever mentioned to me um, the fact that the earth was not neutral, but negatively charged. No professor ever taught me or even mentioned that if you, if you um, uh, take the, the, the electrical plug and plug it into a socket, that extra third prong um, connects to a vast sea of electrically negative charge. Uh, who ever heard of such a thing? But I heard about it when a Russian guy was in my laboratory and um, started talking about the electric field of the earth. And I said, Andre, you're talking about the magnetic field, right? No, 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 I'm talking about the electric field. And my response, I never heard of such a thing. You know, I grew up in electrical engineering and I never heard of electric field around the earth. He said, well, your education was deficient because in Russia, even middle school students know that the earth is negatively charged, you know, and uh, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I, uh, next morning, um, I came back um, and one of my students handed me the famous lectures of the Nobel laureate Richard Feynman, you know, considered to be the Einstein of the second half of the 20th century and his volumes of physics, three volumes are famous. Uh, uh, I, I would venture to say that most, if not almost all graduate students in physics in the US at least read his lectures. They're funny, they're clear, etc. And he was a professor at Caltech. And so the student hands me volume two, chapter nine. Um, and in that chapter, it, it presents all the evidence for the negative charge of the earth. So, and it was plentiful and certainly convinced me. So what's going on is if you connect yourself electrically by any, of, any number of means um, um, to the earth, uh, what happens is you're connecting yourself electrically to a practically infinite supply of negative charge. So the negative charge is the easy water. If you don't have enough negative charge or enough easy water in one of your cells leading to dysfunction, you connect yourself electrically to the earth and those negative charges come running in to, to create easy water. We know from laboratory uh, experiments that you, you you take water, you put negative charge into that water and around that negative charge, EZ builds from that negative charge. It, uh, the negative charge converts the water into EZ water, which is negatively charged, and you get a buildup of that. So I think a, a simple, I'm sorry it went on for so long, but a simple explanation um, for the health benefits of connecting yourself to the earth uh, derives from the, negative charge that runs in from the earth to your body, building easy water and improving function. That's, that's my hypothesis as to why, um, why taking off your shoes and walking on the wet grass is good for you. 
or hugging a tree or however you or connecting yourself to a plate, um, an aluminum plate that's in turn connected to the earth, why all of those maneuvers will be will be beneficial for health. So I've listed a half dozen um, different um, uh, courses of action, um, each of which I, I think is known to improve health. And I also think that the mechanism has to do with the buildup of easy water in cells that might for some reason um, be be lacking easy water and therefore being dysfunctional. And let me just just end this little segment by talking about about um, um, pathologies. You know, if if the easy water, if the negative charge of the cell is due to the easy water, which has a negative charge, then you'd expect that um, um, cells that have uh, uh, um, uh, electrical potential that's smaller, a negative electrical potential, instead of minus 80 millivolts, let's say, which is typical if they have minus 20 millivolts, instead of minus 80, it means that they have less easy water because the easy water is what's building up to give you that electrical potential. And if you don't have, therefore, if you don't have enough easy water, your cells will be either dysfunctional or pathological even. So it turns out I was curious and I, I, I checked old measurements in cancer cells and in pathological kidney cells. And there are probably others I just um, haven't looked deeply yet enough. Instead of minus 80 or so, the cancer cells are minus 10 or minus 15. Huh. And, and very similar for the pathological kidney cells. So, you know, if what I've told you and makes sense, the line of thinking, it's possible that cancer, cancer cells, cancer is associated with a deficiency for whatever reason in easy water. And therefore the cancer cells um, um, are pathological, obviously, and they, they go on to divide and they continue to divide because, because you know, um, it's possible that this deficiency in water um, creates a situation in which the cells just keep dividing and never go back to the quiescent state, and then you have cancer. This is, so this is another, you might say, lead in a, a, a different direction. But, you know, the entire story about dysfunction and possibly pathology could arise from this uh, central uh, a feature of, of easy water and a deficiency of this easy water, which makes cells uh, become dysfunctional. So let me stop my speech here because I, I, I think you, you've got questions and I don't want to go on and give a lecture. Um, that's, uh, that's fantastic, Dr. Palak. I think you've actually um, answered all the questions that I had and sort of have summarized all the content that I wanted us to get across for our listeners. So thank you very much for that. I got oh, I had one question that um, just came up through some of what you were talking about earlier on, and that is um, sort of seasonal affective disorder or SADS and the role that, you know, a lot of people think that could be related to just vitamin D and sunshine from that perspective. But it, I started to wonder whether there could very much well be a connection with sort of easy water again, ultimately, when we think about how people respond to, to winter months. Well, I, I, I think so. Uh, you know, I... Uh... And you just follow the crowd and you can see the, the Scandinavians uh, migrating south, <laughs> if they can afford it, um, for a month or two during the winter. I, I, I have a, a friend originally from Australia um, who migrated to the Yucatan, um, where there's ample sunshine throughout, throughout the year. And, and um, he had some physical issues and they seem to have uh, disappeared with that persistent uh, sunshine. So yeah, I, um, I, I think there is, is something, something to it. And it also explains um, infrared uh, therapy. You know, there's a, a lot of interest these days in light therapy, particularly um, uh, some of the red light and infrared. And, you know, I think from, from what I've said, there's a, a good chance that the efficacy of those those therapies derives from the buildup of uh, of easy water, uh, transitioning the cells, whatever cells are responsible for the disorder, and um, 
in the case of seasonal affective disorder, uh, somewhere up here, the, the constant barrage of, of infrared or treatment of infrared reversing the disorder because of the, um, because of reversing the decline for whatever reason of, of easy water. Amazing. So I think, you know, to summarize that the easy water is, is um, central, absolutely central for all of health. The easy water participates or fourth phase water participates in, um, in, in everything the body, well, maybe, you know, that's an exaggeration because we haven't, we haven't studied everything, <laughs> but, but it plays a really major role in our health and, you know, maybe unexpectedly so, and it's all tied together in, in, in this issue of easy, the easy water that fills our cells, not liquid uh, water that fills our cells. And, um, you know, uh, it, it, the details uh, of all of that uh, are discussed in that book that you mentioned early on, or I mentioned uh, the fourth phase of, of, of water. And, um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm extremely excited about, about the, this kind of um, innovation, if you call it that. Um, you know, I repeat that our work stands on the shoulders of giants. Um, many people knew that the water in, inside our bodies, inside our cells is structured uh, water. And I, our contribution has merely been to bring that to a new level of understanding. It's by no means original. The idea of structured water goes back many generations, starting, you know, probably at the turn of the previous century. So um, there we are. Excellent. No, Dr. Patty, thank you so much for this. I really appreciate your time and sharing your experience, your wisdom and your knowledge on this topic, because I think, as you say, it, it's kind of paramount for a lot of our listeners struggling with all sorts of different symptoms and conditions. You've listed a lot of things that are uh, not only incredibly powerful, but uh, many of them free, <laughs> many of them easy to do. Um, so it's the polar opposite of a lot of the noise that's out there at the moment in regards to complexity when it comes to improving our well-being. So I think that's just another beautiful part to, to this kind of story. Oh, thank you. And I, I, I guess I'll end with just, um, you know, you mentioned complexity. And um, my own view is that science is simple, the underlying principles. And if you read it, textbook or something and it looks complex in my view is probably wrong <laughs> because the principle of nature as we've known since um, uh, sir sir william of ockham in the 14th century i think or something like that uh, simplicity prevails so we we end with that thank you alex yeah. appreciate your questions and the opportunity to connect no, thank you, dr pollack Okay, great.